In contrast to passive transport, active transport requires energy in the form of ATP. The free energy that is released from ATP transports solutes against their concentration gradient. Active transport is an uphill process where solutes move from an area of low concentration on one side of the cell membrane to an area of high concentration on the other side of the membrane. This movement can be in any direction, either into or out of the cell. Along with the need for ATP, a specific carrier or transport protein is required for active transport. These proteins are called pumps when engaged in active transport and are specific to the solute they are transporting. There are many different types of solutes that move through the membrane by active transport, including ions like sodium and potassium ions, as well as larger molecules such as amino acids and monosaccharide sugars like glucose. There are two types of active transport, primary and secondary. Primary active transports require solutes that are found in a concentration gradient across the cell membrane, a supply of ATP, and a specialized membrane transport protein. A large percentage of the cell's ATP energy, about 40%, drives primary active transport processes. We'll explore secondary active transport in another video. The most common type of primary active transport in animal cells is the sodium-potassium ion pump, which uses a carrier protein called sodium-potassium ATPase to help move sodium and potassium ions across the membrane. A portion of this protein acts as an enzyme that helps break down ATP through hydrolysis reactions. ATP is broken down into ADP and a phosphate ion, along with the energy that is used to power the transports. Normally, most sodium ions are concentrated outside of the cell in the extracellular fluid, the ECF. Most potassium ions are found in high concentrations within the cell's cytosol, also called the intracellular fluid, the ICF. The concentration of both ions in these fluid environments is 10 to 20 times higher than their concentrations on the opposite sides of the membrane. Because of their high concentrations, some of the sodium and potassium ions leak across the cell and move downhill through passive diffusion, moving down their concentration gradients from high to low concentration, with sodium diffusing into the cell and potassium diffusing out of the cell, respectively. But the cell must maintain its higher sodium and ion concentration gradients. So in order to do that, these ions must be transported uphill against their normal concentration gradients from low to high concentration, which is where the sodium-potassium pump protein comes into play. The sodium-potassium pump helps maintain the normal membrane tonicity, which balances water's normal concentration both inside and outside the cell. This helps prevent the cell from excessively shrinking, swelling, and possibly bursting because of water and salt imbalances. Let's break down the four major steps of the sodium-potassium ion pump. The cell needs to pump the sodium ions out of the cell and into the ECF, moving them from a low concentration inside the cell to a higher concentration outside the cell. The pump can transport three sodium ions at a time. In step one, three sodium ions attach to a specific binding site on the protein. In step two, an ATP molecule undergoes hydrolysis to produce ADP, a phosphate group, and a release of free energy that powers the active transport. The released phosphate binds to the protein, increasing its energy state and causing the protein to change its shape. As the protein shape shifts, it pumps the three sodium ions outside the cell, exporting them into the ECF. 
The three sodium ions are now added to the other sodium ions in the ECF to maintain a higher concentration of sodium in this environment. You can remember the direction of the sodium ions movement using the phrase, sodium is sent out of the cell. In step three, as the protein changes shape, it allows two incoming potassium ions to attach to a binding site on the ECF side of the protein, which releases the phosphate group. In step four, another shape change occurs, which imports the potassium ions into the cytosol. The two potassium ions are now added to the other potassium ions in the cytosol to maintain a higher concentration of potassium in this environment. You can remember the direction of the potassium ions movement using the phrase, potassium is pumped into the cell. The protein pump is now reset to accept three more sodium ions from the cytosol and pump them into the ECF. The process continues again and again as long as there are sodium and potassium ions available, as well as a steady supply of ATP. A great analogy that describes how the sodium-potassium pump works is that of a revolving door at the entrance to a hotel or office building. It requires energy to push the revolving door in order to allow you to walk into the building and for other people to walk out of the building. This is similar to how the pump requires ATP energy to export three sodium ions out of the cell and import two potassium ions in.